Hey everybody, welcome to Active Churches at Home. My name is Joe. And I'm Shauna, and we're on the team here. And we're so glad you're tuning in today. Last night was so incredible for our church community. We had something we call Trunk or Tree on our campus, and it was huge. You showed up, you showed out, we gave out candy, we had the best time. How many trunks did we have? We had over 50 trunks on our campus last uh, night, and nuts. it was amazing because of you, Active yeah. Church, and our community coming together, we were able to put on an awesome event. Yeah, and maybe you came for the first time to check out Active Church through Trunk or Treat and you're watching with us today. Welcome, so glad you are here. Again, my name is Joe, this is Shauna, but we want to know you as well. Text welcome to the number that is on the screen or you can just say, hey, I'm new in the comment section. Our comment section is like our lobby. Let's get connected. And we also want to send you an Amazon gift card just to say thanks for showing up today on Sunday morning. And who doesn't love an Amazon gift card, yeah. right? If you are coming back, welcome. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. Just leave a comment and our team would love to get connected and make sure you hit that subscribe button. Yeah, one big thing I want to let you know about is something we call First Step. That's going to be next Sunday. First Step is a chance for you to know about Active Church, know about the team, meet with us, meet with Pastor Mike, and learn more about the future of Active Church, but how you can be a part of Active. So if you've never been to First Step, maybe you're new to church, new to faith, new to God, new to this whole church experience, we want to get connected to you. We want you to be more than just a watcher at home, but we want to be a part of the Active Church community. So all the details for First Step next week are going to be in the description, and we're going to be doing one online. So it's going to be in person and online. Get connected, look at the details for more information. But if you're on campus, I was told there's an awesome treat waiting yeah. for you. I, so. can't, I can't wait for that treat. <laughs> and finally, we have something that we do every week called giving. Your giving is what makes these events possible. Mm -hmm. It also makes things like First Step possible. So thank you for giving as you've already given before Active Church. And if you're new to this, new to giving, I want to invite you to participate with us because your giving and this act of giving is changing the world and changing our city. So thank you for how you give. And there's two ways that you can give with us today. You can go to activechurches.com and just click the give button or a really easy way to do it is just text the amount to the number that's on the screen. Now, I love this next moment. We're gonna go into something we call worship. And what worship is, is praying to God with music. So if you're new to this, you've been doing this for a while, this is so much fun. Stand to your feet, maybe just turn the volume up, whatever that looks like. Let's worship together, Active Church. And can I just say, welcome home. Comes awake every. 
captive, breaking free Right now, right now, right now Darkness trembles, mountains shake
Hey Active Church, it's Joe again. I wanna let you know about some church news that we have coming up. First thing, First Step is next Sunday. I love First Step, it's a chance for us to get connected as a community. So maybe you're new to God, new to faith, new to active, new to church. This is the perfect experience for you. Come meet the team, come meet Pastor Mike, and come hear about the vision and values of Active Church. All the details can be found in the description. Secondly, on Tuesday night, is there's a big day. It's a big day for our nation. And in the middle of this big day, we wanna pause and we wanna pray and we wanna ask the question, what does love require of us? What does being a follower of Jesus mean in the midst of uncertain and unprecedented time? Well, lucky for us, Jesus didn't leave us in the dark. And on Tuesday night at 7 p.m., we're gonna gather with our team and we're gonna be sharing about the hope and love of Jesus, but also answering that question of what does it look like for us to follow Jesus in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of unsettled hearts, in the midst of anxiety. So I wanna invite you at seven o'clock to join us on Facebook Live as Pastor Mike, Pastor James, and I, and the entire team just pray for our nation and pray for the future of our community. And lastly, I wanna invite you into something we call giving. Giving is an act of worship. It allows us to put God first rather than last. What we do in this moment is we say, God, you are the one who gives, and we trust that you are gonna do immeasurably more with our finances than we can do alone. Giving has allowed Active Church to thrive. Giving has allowed the kingdom of God to thrive in our city. Given, giving has provided hope for this city. So keep giving with us in one of two ways. The first way is online at activechurches.com. Click the Give button. Or the second way is you can text the amount to the number that is on the screen. We are heading into our fourth week of our series, In Our Messy World. And Pastor Mike has a great message for you today. But before he jumps into that message, will you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we come to you, some of us with heavy hearts, some of us with tired knees, some of us just needing a refresher. And God, in this moment right now, we know that you are gonna be that refreshment. We wanna see you. We wanna hear from you today, God. And I want you to speak to us loudly in the middle of this messy world. God, we give you everything we have. And we all lift this up in your son's holy name. And all God's people said, amen. Hi and welcome to Active Church. My name is Mike. I serve as the lead pastor here at Active and I'm so glad that you've decided to join us today for week three of a series called In Our Messy World. And here's the premise that we're running with. Our world is messy and I don't think I need to convince you of that. And there is one voice that can help turn that mess into a message. And that voice is the voice of God. And when we prioritize that voice, when it's the loudest and the strongest and the truest in our life, we can tell a better story. We began two weeks ago talking about what it looks like to prioritize the voice of God. Then last week, we talked about how God speaks to us through the pages and documents that we call the Bible. Today, I want to talk to you about an extraordinary way that God communicates to you and me in our messy world. God speaks through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is one of the things that makes Christianity so unique. It's one of the ways that we know that God is for us and not against us. But it can be a complex doctrine. It can be a bit confusing, maybe a bit mysterious. And so what I want to do in our time today is I want to demystify the Holy Spirit and make it accessible so that we can understand how God is speaking to you and me in our messy world. And so there's three things that I want to do with our time today. First, I want to talk about who the Holy Spirit is, then I want to talk about how he works, and then I want to share a true story from the pages and documents that we call the Bible about how God speaks to you and me in our messy world through the Holy Spirit. So first, let's talk about who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is God. It's not a God. It's not one of many gods. It's not an artificial God. The Holy Spirit is God. 
in spirit. Just like Jesus is God in the flesh, God with skin on, God in a bod, the Holy Spirit is God in spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the power of God. It's the God flex in the Godhead in the story of God. One writer says that the Holy Spirit is what raised Jesus from the dead. It's his power that raised Jesus from the dead. And when you and I trust in Jesus, when we believe that he is Lord, that he is God, that he did die for the forgiveness of sins, rose from the grave three days later to defeat our death and the consequences of our sins, when we believe that, there is a promise and there is a gift that comes. The promise is that God is with us, that he doesn't turn his back on us. The gift is how we know that God is with us. The gift is the Holy Spirit that lives within us. This is what's so remarkable about the Christian faith, because we believe, and Jesus has taught us, and the writers of the scriptures have taught us, that the Holy Spirit lives within us. So when we know that God is with us, it's not in this physical presence around us, but that God is with us because he lives in us. Suddenly, we are the temple. Suddenly, we are the church. It's why we've said for years, especially this year, that the building is not the church. It's why we've said that you and I are the church, because God is in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit in you and in me when we trust in Jesus is remarkable. It's why we can have a renewed mind and a transformed heart. It's why God can do a great work in this world because he starts that great work in you and in me. This is who the Holy Spirit is. And then Paul, one of the most famous Christians of all time, one of the most prominent writers of the New Testament in the Bible, Paul actually writes about how the Holy Spirit works. He wrote a letter to Christians like you and me in the city called Rome. The letter was called Romans. And in chapter 8, he lists some things that you and I are thinking about, that you and I are feeling. And he addresses those things. In Romans chapter 8, he says there are three things that we sense in our body, in our person. First, we sense that things around us are not as they should be. Or could be. We also sense that things within us, who we are, we are not who we could be or should be, that there is a gap between where we are and where we will be. And then he speaks about how there's something stirring in us that tells us that there is a better story that's possible. There's this tension between what is and what can be and what will be. And Paul says that is the stirring of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is announcing in you that there is a better story to be told, that the best really is yet to come. This is why you and I can have hope, because God said, I'm leading you somewhere. And we know that he's leading us, and we know that he's not going to leave us, and we know that he's going to transform us because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul gives us a really simple analogy to help us understand the work of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, he writes these words. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us and for us with groans that words cannot express. Paul says, there's this weakness that we feel, this tension between where we are and where we want to be, where we are currently and where God is taking us. And sometimes we don't know how to fill the gap. We don't know how to resolve the tension. Maybe we don't even know how to manage the tension. And that's where the work of the Holy Spirit is powerful. That's where God speaks in our messy world through the Holy Spirit. Paul writes that it's in those moments, maybe we're struggling with words to pray. It's in those moments that God gives us words through the Holy Spirit so that we know what the next step might actually look like or sound like. That stirring in you and in me, according to Paul, is the Holy Spirit of God. And what I love about the Holy Spirit, this is what I love about God and the story of God, is that he always calls us forward. And he doesn't do it, according to Paul, out of guilt and out of shame. He does it by acknowledging that there is a tension between where we are 
and where we want to be, between where God has us right now and where God is taking us. And this isn't about God loving us more. It isn't about God being pleased with us. This is about God saying, it's okay to not be okay, but it's also okay to want to be okay. God is going to love us right where we're at, and yet he's going to lead us to a place that he has created us to be and created us to do. This is how God speaks to you and me through the power of the Holy Spirit. The invitation that Paul gives us is to pay attention to the tension in life. Pay attention to the tensions that you're feeling in life. This is how God speaks through the Holy Spirit. This is how the Holy Spirit works. The most important thing that you and I can do when faced with the right thing to do versus something to do or the right thing to do versus maybe the wrong thing to, thing to do is to pay attention to the tension that we're feeling. If there's a hesitation that we would stop and we would pause and we would pay attention to that because it's in that tension, according to Paul, according to Jesus, according to the writers of the scriptures, that God speaks to you and me in our messy world. And we know that the Holy Spirit is powerful. It raised Jesus from the dead. And that's the same spirit that's in you and in me. But often we don't pay attention to the tension. Often what we'll try to do is we'll sell ourselves on the thing that we really don't want to do. We'll begin to buy the lie and sell ourselves on the lie instead of believing what is good and true and right and stepping into that so that we can move closer to God. Question for you, have you ever tried to sell yourself on a lie? You know that it's not the right thing to do. You know that it's not the good thing to do. You know that you're lying to yourself, but you're selling yourself on it because deep down, maybe you kind of sort of really want to do it. Maybe you selling yourself on the lie has sounded like this. It's okay. I deserve this because I didn't get this from them. So I'm going to do this because I should have received it from them. So I'm going to make this decision. I'm going to take this step. Even though I know it's not the right thing to do, I'm going to sell myself on doing this thing because I believe I deserve it. Maybe selling yourself on the lie sounds a bit like this. Don't worry. It's just this time and it won't affect every time. You ever told yourself that? You ever heard that excuse in your heart and in your mind? Maybe selling yourself on the lie sounds a bit like this. It's wrong. So just don't tell anyone. I'm going to play it close to the chest. Maybe selling yourself on the lie sounds like this in your marriage. Sure, my husband will be offended and hurt if he found out. But my husband isn't bright enough to find out. You've convinced yourself it's the right thing to do. Or maybe in your relationship, you've said this. Yes, my girlfriend would be devastated, but she's not nearly as attractive as they are. Isn't it interesting that we try to sell ourselves on all types of decisions? that we know are not healthy and hopeful and godly decisions. And here's here's the really interesting thing. We rarely have to sell ourselves on the right thing to do, on the prudent thing to do, on the good thing to do, on the right idea. We rarely have to sell ourselves on that, but we will always sell ourselves on the lie, on the thing that we really don't wanna do. And it's in those moments according to Paul, according to Jesus, according to the scriptures, that God is speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit in our messy world. And when you find yourself, when you find yourself trying to sell yourself on the lie, maybe perhaps you and perhaps I need to come up with a new phrase that acknowledges what we're doing to ourselves. Maybe we need to say to ourselves, okay, I'm doing it. I'm making things up and I'm selling myself on something that I don't want to do. Maybe you need to think that or perhaps even say that out loud. I'm doing it. I'm selling myself on the thing that I don't really want to do. Because when you pay attention to the tension, it opens your eyes, more importantly, your heart and your mind to the voice of God who is speaking to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's who the Holy Spirit is, that's how the Holy Spirit works. And I want to share with you a fascinating narrative in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, about how this looks in everyday life so that we can know how God is speaking in our messy world through the Holy Spirit. 
The story is about King David, but it's before he became the king. We meet David in this story as a shepherd boy, and he actually fights a man named Goliath and an entire army called the Philistines, and he defeats that army, first defeats Goliath, then the Israel army defeats the Philistines, and this makes David incredibly famous. So famous, in fact, that it caused a problem with the current king. His name is Saul, because David around this time, had already been anointed as the next king. And Saul knew that David was a threat to him, not only to his reputation, but to his dynasty. And so Saul decides to eliminate David. That's killing him. And he's not going to do it himself at first. He decides to send David out to fight all the wars that he caused. And here's the great thing. David wins all those wars. David, because he's a great leader, actually dominates all of those wars, which actually grows his fame and causes Saul to be even more frustrated. And so Saul decides, I'm just going to take matters into my own hand and I'm going to eliminate David. I'm going to kill David. And that's where we're going to pick up this story in a document called 1 Samuel. If you have a Bible or the Bible app with you, would you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 24 and we'll begin in verse 2. And as you're turning there, here's the scene. David hears about how Saul is wanting to threaten his life. In fact, there's a moment where Saul actually tries to kill David and David's shocked by that. So he runs for his life and decides not to go to war with the king because he loves, he loves Israel. He loves his country and he doesn't want them to go through all of that. He knows one day he'll be king, but he doesn't believe it's today. And so he goes into the desert and he's surrounded by these mighty warriors who believe that David is a better leader. They see what Saul is doing. And so they decide to move their whole life and their whole way of life to the movement and the way of Jesus, the movement and the way of David, really. And they decide that they're going to spend the rest of their life with him. Saul decides that he's going to go and hunt down David. And that's where we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 24, starting in verse 2. Saul took 3,000 chosen men to go and look for David and his men. He heard a rumor that they were out in the desert. And so they go out, 3,000 of them, to look for David. And then Samuel, who's writing this, gives us this interesting nugget, this narrative that helps us to always know that these are true stories. In verse 3, he says, There was a cave, and Saul, being a human, Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. He needed to go to the bathroom. And so Saul went into the cave to do just that. And then it gets even more interesting, more fascinating. Samuel writes that David and his men were in the same cave, far back in the cave. I mean, what are the odds of that? Like, this is the best case scenario for David. Saul wants to eliminate him. David is now an enemy of Saul. And really, David is looking at Saul as his enemy. And now he's got him in this cave. David, his eyes have adjusted to the darkness of the cave. Saul hasn't. David's in the back of the cave with all of his men. I mean, this is actually a really great scenario for David. Imagine what was going through his mind in this moment. Maybe he was thinking, did God deliver my enemy into my hands? Because there he is, not paying attention, relieving himself, and I could take him down right now. And David, he's the next king. And the only thing that stood in the way of him becoming king was Saul. And then David's men, who are surrounding him, whisper as they're in this cave. They said to David, this is the day that the Lord spoke about when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands. David, this is the promise of God. And now the waiting is over. And by the way, if you're a good leader, you're a CEO, you're a boss, you're an employer. If you're a good leader, you know that optics as you lead are really important meaning that how people see it is really necessary, especially in a social media world. You want to tell a really good story in a social media world. David sees this moment as the optics being amazing because Saul walks into the cave and then out comes David. And here's what would have happened if David came out and Saul's life was taken. All of the men that followed Saul would surrender and follow David because they all knew he was going to be the next king anyway. And here's why the optics would be great. There's not going to be a war. There's only going to be one death. It was this king who's reckless. 
and it would be completely easy. David could take over the throne in this moment. And it's in this moment that David actually felt something else, a tension, a hesitation that really didn't make sense. And at first, David ignored it. Samuel's writing this document, and he says in verse 4 that David crept up unnoticed to Saul. Army crawl in the cave, creeping up to take the life of the king. And it says as he got closer, the tension felt stronger. And then suddenly, the hesitation that didn't make sense at first, it made perfect sense. Because as David got closer to Saul, in the darkness of this cave with the plan to kill him, David must have thought, I'm about to murder the king. I'm about to take the life of the anointed one of God. Yes, I'm going to be the next king. Yes, that's God's plan. Yes, I know that. But I'm about to take the life of my king. And I would be right in the eyes of everybody else, but would it be right in the eyes of God? I'm about to murder the king. This would have been David's legacy. This would have been David's story. Maybe he wrestled as he's crawling towards Saul. Is this a story I want to tell? Maybe he was thinking about like the holidays, <laughs> Christmas, right? And maybe he was thinking about his grandchildren or maybe his great-grandchildren coming up to him and saying, Grandpa, Merry Christmas. Hey, could you tell us the story about how you murdered the king in the cave? <laughs> I'm sure David's thinking, I don't want that story to be my story. I don't want that to be my legacy. I don't want to be known for that. And then the text tells us, Samuel, as he's writing this, he tells us David is conscience stricken, like almost sick to his stomach as he gets closer to Saul. And this tension that he felt inside felt so irrational. And yet he paid attention to the tension because he believed that maybe God is saying something to him in that moment. And because he paid attention to the tension, it saved him from becoming what he never hoped to be. A murderer. Someone who takes the life of the king. He would have been known as the man who killed the king. And so instead, as he gets close to Saul, David takes a piece of Saul's robe that he's wearing, he cuts off the edge of it, and then he goes back to his men. And I'm sure they were frustrated because they were probably cheering him on quietly as they saw him going after Saul. And then he comes back with the edge of Saul's robe. And David, when he gets back, whispers to them, the Lord forbid that I do such a thing. The Lord forbid that I take a life. The Lord forbid that I be a murderer. And so the men start talking and they're like, well, then we're just going to do it. We're going to go take his life for you so that you don't have to be guilty. You don't have to be ashamed. You could just say, well, these men did it. And David actually speaks up and tells them no. And Samuel says, he writes these words down. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. Whew. So close. They were so close to a totally different story. I have three brothers, one older, two younger. And we had, in our backyard growing up, a big giant dirt hill. And we created two roads on that hill. One was the safe and fun road. The other one was like the devil's drop sort of road. One, you could make it down and wouldn't have to worry about your life. The other, you would have to be concerned if you were going to have life after you reached the bottom. And of course, because we were boys, we decided to do the big drop, the devil's drop. And we never told our mama about it. That's why we got away with it. So we got to keep this between you and me, okay? And I remember that when we would go down that drop, there was always this concern that we're going to really get hurt. But it didn't stop us from doing the most ridiculous thing, the dangerous thing. And there was a phrase that we would yell so often as we would go down that hill because we would go down and maybe we would hit two wheels. We would go down and maybe flip over the front of these wagons that we were riding in. And the phrase we would yell out is, oh, so close. Because we wanted to take this hill. We wanted to accomplish this great feat. And we knew that on the other side of this great feat was actually danger. 
We could potentially really break some bones or maybe even lose a life. But we're boys. And we wanted to do this incredible, what we thought, courageous thing to do. And there were moments where it was a close call. It was so close. That's this moment for David. He was so close to being a murderer. And instead, he chose to be a giver of life. He was so close to changing his entire story, to influencing his entire legacy. The narrative would have been completely different if he took the life of Saul. Question for you. Are you close? Are you in a situation or a circumstance where there's tension and you're getting close? Are you contemplating something that maybe you shouldn't contemplate? Is there something that you're trying to sell yourself on? Is there a bad idea that you're trying to convince yourself is a good idea? Are you buying the lie? Are you selling yourself on the lie? Is there a tension in your life that you need to pay attention to? Is there something that you want to do that you never would want told about you? Can I make a suggestion? Would you hit pause? Would you stop selling yourself? Would you start listening? Would you pay attention to the tension? Because that tension that you're feeling, it's the voice of God in our messy world through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the voice of God who loves you and is doing everything he can to keep you from doing the thing that you really don't want to do. That he really doesn't want you to do. The story is remarkable in how it ends because Saul leaves the cave. He sees all of his men. And as they begin to search for David, he hears a voice, a familiar voice, and he turns around and at the front of that same cave where he was going to the bathroom stands David. And before David says a word, it says that he bows all the way down low to the ground to honor the king. And when he stands back up, he holds up in his hand the corner of Saul's robe. And then he begins, he, he begins to give a really incredible speech. And he ends that speech with these words. May the Lord be the judge between you and me, Saul. May the Lord avenge the wrongs that you've done to me, Saul. But my hand will not touch you. Because I'm choosing to do the right thing. I'm choosing not to do the thing that's trying to sell me on the thing that I don't want to do. And everybody there knew who the better man was. They knew that David could have taken the life of Saul, but he didn't. And as he stood there with the corner of the robe, I'm sure that all of the men around, even Saul's men said that, now that's a king. Now that's a leader. Now that's somebody who is paying attention to the tension. And don't miss this. David decided not to use Saul's bad behavior to behave badly. What about you? Are you considering behaving badly based upon someone's bad behavior? The election's Tuesday. We'll get the results maybe Tuesday night, maybe Wednesday, maybe even Thursday. And what you might see is some chaos or you might see some frustration, you might see some emotion, and that might spark emotion in you. And I would ask you to wrestle with this question. Are you considering behaving badly based upon someone's bad behavior? David decided not to allow Saul's bad behavior to influence his behavior. I think often what they did to you and to me, or they're trying to do to you or to me, can influence what we do to everybody else around us. And we have a decision to make. Are we going to sell ourselves on that bad behavior? Are we going to behave like someone that maybe we don't even like? We wouldn't want to be like, but we're choosing to be like them. Friends, we rarely have to sell ourselves on the right thing to do. And we will always have to sell ourselves on the wrong thing to do. And it's in this moment that David chooses to spare the life of Saul and all eyes turn to him. And Saul is humiliated by David's humility because David was the better person. He was the better king. He was the better leader, the better 
man. And the only thing that Saul could do in this moment was to turn around and walk back to Jerusalem. And friends, that's the power of paying attention to the tension because that is how God is speaking in our messy world through the Holy Spirit in your life and in mine. Now, just so we're clear, the tension that you are experiencing right now may not be the tension to murder a king or to take the life of anybody, at least I hope not, but the tension that you might be feeling right now has the potential to destroy the story that you want to tell. The tension that you're feeling right now, the thing that you're contemplating, has the potential to destroy everything that you've built up until this point. Which is why we got to pay attention to the tension. Which is why we got to let that tension bother us. Which is why we have to stop selling ourselves on the lie and start listening to the voice of God in our messy world through the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you this. Maybe you can ask this of yourself. Is there a tension that needs your attention? Is there a tension that deserves your attention? Because when you pay attention to that, it's like a preemptive strike to becoming what you never intended to become. It's deciding, I don't want that. I'm not going to sell myself on that. I have a better story to tell because I have God within me. And he's speaking to me. When you pay attention to the tension, it allows you to decide what's the better story? What's the way of Jesus? Where are we going? Because, friends, every habit begins with the first time, every pattern begins with the first line, and every journey begins with the first step. And if there's something that's bothering you right now, if there's a tension in your heart that's causing hesitation, let it bother you because, friends, that's the voice of God. Even if you're not a Christian, that's the voice of God who is inviting you to trust in him. If you're a Christian, that's the voice of God who is inviting you to trust him again and obey him because he is worth your surrender. He is worth your submission. He, God, is for you and lives within you when you trust in him. Face that tension until it goes away or you choose a different way. The Holy Spirit will always cause you to feel and know and experience the gap between where you are and where God is leading you. It's not a feeling of guilt. It's not a feeling of shame. It's not an emotional feeling. It's a feeling. It's a perspective. It's an experience of tension. And when you feel the tension, a great question to ask yourself is this. Is this next decision a decision that will bring me closer to the God who wants to be close to me? That's how God is speaking in our messy world through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when you feel the tension, pause and pinpoint where the cause is coming from. When you feel the tension, explore it rather than ignoring it. Maybe for you, you need to begin to think about the tension that deserves your attention today. Maybe for some of you, it's time that you stopped writing the tension. And you surrendered the tension. You made a powerful, godly, holy, and helpful decision in that tension that announced that Jesus is Lord of your life. In one month, on December 6th, we're going to celebrate in a very public way the decision to get baptized for many of you. And I want to invite you to decide today if that's you, if that's the direction you want to go by saying publicly, No more am I going to lead the way. I want God to lead me in his way. And if you're considering baptism, if you want more information about that, or if today you want to make a decision about that, I want to invite you to text baptism to the number on the screen. If you're listening to this, that's baptism. And text it to 951-900-3627. 951-900-3627. Because that decision will be one of the best decisions you make as you feel the tension in life. It's saying you've paid attention to it and you've decided to choose the way of Jesus instead of selling yourself on the lie that you're telling yourself. Friends, is there a tension that you need to pay attention to? Because that is God speaking in our messy world through his Holy Spirit. Let me pray some words over you. 
So that we're all experiencing the gap, the tension between where we are and where we will be because you are faithful and you will lead us to the place where we will be. And this isn't about you loving us more. It isn't about you being for us any more than you already are. This is about us choosing to trust in you. This is about us choosing to obey you. This is about us living in your story and in your kingdom, and being the best type of person for this earth as we build your kingdom on earth. So God, I pray that you would forgive us for those moments where we've sold ourselves on a lie. I pray that you would forgive us for those decisions that we've made that have destroyed our story. And may today be a day where we can renew, we can be redeemed, and we can be set free from some of the past decisions. May we pay attention to the tension so that we can hear your voice, God, in our messy world. In Jesus' name, together we say amen and amen and amen. Our hope and our prayer is that you can see God in everything and always. So if you're new to this, your first time coming, or maybe you've been doing this for a while, we hope that Pastor Mike's message helped you take one more step closer to God. And I just want to remind you, next week, November 8th, is our first step experience yeah. at 1015 on campus mm -hmm. and 1230 online. You do not want to miss this opportunity to meet the team, join the community, and enjoy a great snack. Yeah, all the details are going to be in the description. And Active Church, again, thank you for your generosity. There's so much that we're able to do because of your generosity. Like, reach people with the love and hope of Jesus. Keep giving with us in one of two ways. First way is online at activechurches.com, and you can click the Give button. Or the second way is you can text the amount to the number that is on the screen. Active Church, we love you, and we'll see you next week. Love you guys.